the next system. Uh, I just want to say a moment, take a moment to congratulate the uh, New Economy Coalition for pulling off one hell of a conference. My goodness. Uh, and um, we have a very distinguished uh, panel this morning, and I want to begin by introducing them so you'll know who these characters are. Uh, and I'll introduce them in the order that they will, will speak. Um, uh, Emily uh, Kawano uh, is probably best known to, to us as the coordinator of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. Uh, she'll be on another panel later uh, describing that work. Uh, she's also the uh, co-director of the Wellsprings uh, Cooperative in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is germinating a lot of other cooperatives, and is a well-known leader and author and speaker in the field of the social and solidarity economy. Ed Whitfield, in the middle, uh, I must say that people who work in the South uh, in the trenches are heroes to me. And uh, Ed has been an activist there since the 1960s. It's hard work. Uh, and it's even harder in North Carolina these days. Uh, a decade ago in North Carolina, he founded the Fund for Democratic Communities, which has been his, his operating base. And more recently, he helped to launch the Southern Grassroots Economies Project and the Southern Reparations Loan Fund. And as someone who grew up with Jim Crow, and didn't have enough sense at one point in my life to totally reject it. I told Ed earlier today I want to contribute to the reparations fund. <laughs> and um, and our, our third presenter will, will be Mike Lewis. Uh, Mike is the executive director of the Canadian Center for Community Renewal. Uh, he's been engaged in uh, countless community and new enterprise efforts over the years, a real spark plug uh, in Canada, in this country, and around the world. Uh, he's an activist and a synthetic thinker, and the author of a book which will say a lot about him in its title, The Resilience Imperative, Cooperative Transitions to a Steady State Economy. So the panel is a very strong one, and we're happy to have them all. Uh, my name is Gus Speth, uh, and I co-chair, along with Gara Perovitz, who's uh, here, there he is, uh, the Next System Project. And our goal in this project is to help uh, give birth and nursemaid a, a national and regional and local conversation about the need to shift to a new system of political economy, the Next System. You know, when, the, when we have so many grave challenges emerging across the entire spectrum of national and international life. You, you can't say it was because we neglected this or we didn't do enough there. It's because we have a system, we work and live in a system that's perpetuating these disasters and uh, not letting uh, people and planet uh, come first. So, uh, you know, this system that we are in is failing us and it's in my view, failing us uh, so completely that we're entering a period of systemic crisis uh, here and, and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, the current system itself is beginning to be seen as the problem, the root of a multiplicity of grave problems. And as it comes to be seen that way, the system is losing uh, legitimacy. So. Can Thank you. So, so consider this. A recent poll, you saw that, that 70% of the American people say that the economy is rigged against us, right? Okay, move that consciousness some progressions forward from the economy is rigged against us to the economic system is rigged against us, and then move it to the system is rigged against us, and from there to we've got to change the system. And that's where we are with the Next System uh, Project. Uh, and out of this period of systemic crisis uh, and bifurcation, if you will, uh, a new system will emerge. 
It may not be the system we want, but we can make it, I believe, into the system that we want. So the questions arise, what exactly or roughly would we like to see emerge uh, from this systemic crisis and how do we get there? So it was in that context that we launched the Next System Project to open up a debate and a dialogue on these two questions. What do we want and how do we get there? And uh, a couple of basic approaches to answering these questions. One can bring a lot of scholarship and worldly knowledge to it. Oh, one could bring the practitioner's skills and the practitioner's learning uh, to it. And both approaches are highly, highly valuable. So what we've done with the Next System Project is to select about 25 scholars and practitioners who've developed alternative systems, alternative visions of the future, next systems, if you will. And we've asked these people to write them up for us. So we can have them online and share them and summarize them and tweet about them and do all the other things. And, uh, and our goal here is to utterly defeat the idea that there is no alternative, the Tina in uh, Margaret Thatcher's favorite phrase. Um, so far, we've published eight uh, of these futures, and about a dozen more are uh, coming pretty fast now. Uh, and our panelists today uh, share much in common. Uh, but one of the things is that they are all writing one of these futures uh, for us, uh, and they also share the fact that they are both practitioners uh, and scholars and, and bring both uh, understandings uh, to their essays and their work in general. Um, some of the essays that we've written are um, uh, about uh, social democracy uh, we've published. Some are about uh, democratic 21st century socialism. Uh, some have a, a cosmopolitan global citizen orientation and uh, others are strictly localist and see, see little hope for anything beyond a state level action. Uh, some use the market uh, as a tool, an implement. Uh, others have no use for it at all. Uh, many embrace economic democracy, and most uh, question uh, GDP uh, and its growth. Um, and the final thing that I think our panelists uh, share today is, is a basic uh, orientation. And uh, one of them, Mike, uh, wrote something that I want to read to you, and, and, and perhaps the others would, would comment it, on it uh, as well. Uh, what he calls cooperative economic democracy is a framework, he says, that elevates resilience over growth, cooperation over competition, sufficiency over efficiency, well-being over the right to possess, fairness and equity over the freedom of markets and trade and capital, decentralized and democratic ownership over concentrated private ownership, the commons over the inalienable rights of private property, and our dependence on nature over our right to dominate it. I think that those are values that they share, I share, and perhaps uh, most uh, all of you share. So in your comments today, panelists, I hope you'll indicate your reaction to this, uh, this passage, this set of values. Uh, I hope you'll describe your system uh, for us. Uh, give us a leading example of that system in action on the ground uh, today uh, and tell us how you see moving beyond uh, what is already happening into a period of transformational change that moves forward uh, the ideas that you are advocating. So as I mentioned, we'll start with Emily and then Ed and close with Mike and they'll each have uh, 10 minutes uh, and then we'll open the floor uh, for questions and dialogue. And they can either come to the podium or stay seated. Emily. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to be talking about um, the solidarity economy as a as a framework. Um, the solidarity economy is a very big tent. Um, it's really grounded in principles. 
So this will look slightly different in different parts of the world and in, even in different localities. Um, the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network uh, has boiled it down to five. So we talk about solidarity, uh, we talk about uh, participatory democracy, sustainability, equity in all dimensions, race, class, gender, et cetera. And then the last one is pluralism. So that's a commitment to, it's not a one size fits all uh, blueprint. Um, it is, uh, as in the words of the Zapatistas, a world within which many fit. Um, uh, so different things will work in different places at different times, given different cultures, um, different histories, different economic conditions, um, et cetera. Um, so given these principles, uh, solidarity economy is in many ways a theory or a framework in search of practice. So looking around the world, where, wherever we are, what are the practices that fit with these and support and embody these kind of principles? Um, so I'll give some examples in, in a second. Um, but I would say that overall, solidarity economy is very, very clear about um, engaging in a transformative, a systemic transformative process. We are clearly talking about a, a post-capitalist uh, transformation. So we are not talking about, we're very clear, we're not talking about social democracy. As nice as Scandinavia might be in many respects, we are not talking about that because it, those are still capitalist models. Um, and so that's, that is in conflict with the democratic principle where you have your owners and you have your workers and at the end of the day, no matter how benevolent, the owners still have control legally. Um, the, uh, the other overview uh, or general comment that I'll make about solidarity economy is that um, it includes new things and it includes a lot of old things. It includes mainstream things and it includes um, alternatives. It includes uh, market and non-market. It includes monetized and non-monetized. Um, we embrace all of that. Um, so the... To, to give an example, I'm, I'm actually going to decline to give a specific example. And just uh, because the point that I want to make about solidarity economy is that it's really about, uh, about the system and looking at the pieces and trying to knit them together. So as an economist, I think about the uh, five economic spheres, production, distribution and exchange, consumption, finance and governance. There is a wealth of examples of uh, solidarity economy practices in every single one of those spheres. So production, you can think about co uh, worker cooperatives, but you could also think about something that all of you engage in probably every day, which is non-monetized care economy, right? Care work. So if you help your friend, if you ra you're raising your children, you're taking care of your, your elderly parent, you help out a neighbor, this is all, these have really legitimate economic values. Even though it's not counted in our GDP, these things have values. How do we as, a, as, a, as human beings reproduce ourselves? Without the, this kind of care work, none, nothing would be possible. The formal economy would not exist without all that care labor. So that's a huge foundation, right? It doesn't operate on the logic of capitalism and pro maximizing profits, um, but it's huge and it's part of everybody's lives. If we start looking, opening up our eyes to th all the practices, practices that exist already, um, there's, a, there's a tremendous foundation upon which to build. Um, just a couple other examples. Um, in distribution and exchange, we can think about some fair trade, it gets, everything gets a little sticky, nothing is pure, right? So Walmart has its own brand of fair trade. Um, at the other end of the spectrum would be Equal Exchange, which is a, a, a worker cooperative that engages in, in fair trade. Um, we can think about in, in distribution and exchange, we can think about time banks, uh, we can think about social currencies, we can think about consumer supported agriculture as a different, uh, a different relationship between the consumer and the producer where you have this direct relationship and it's not just uh, all price driven. Um, uh, how much time do I have? Okay. Um, 
So quickly, in terms of consumption, we can think of things like food co-ops. We can think also about things like community land trusts, which is, I'm just going to assume that people have a, a sense of what community land, is that a safe assumption? Who knows community land trusts? Oh, most people. Anyway, so it's a different, it's a different way of owning um, land together um, uh, that can preserve in the long run affordability affordability. Um, in finance, we can think about peer lending and crowdfunding. Um, we can think of loan funds and uh, c credit unions, com especially community development credit unions. Um, and in terms of governance, um, we can think about uh, really democratic, participatory democratic processes like participatory budgeting, which is really growing very, f very quickly. Um, but we can also just think about the government. Now, I know the government has been hijacked by, by corporate interests and financial interests. That's true. But if you think about what the government is supposed to be, what the state is supposed to be, it is all about um, governing for the common good. And so there's a challenge there to retake the state, to retake governance. Um, and even while that struggle needs to be fought, there are lots of pieces, uh, for example, public goods that were, are probably keepers, right? So a public education system, for example, would be a keeper in our, our future system, presumably. Um, so there's, there's a huge foundation. So I'm going to transition from those examples in every single sector um, to how do we get to scale? Well, f first of all, um, it's recognizing that we, we're not there, right? All those examples that I gave you, it's not enough, but at least it's better than thinking we have to create all this stuff from scratch, all anew. There's so much to build on, that's one. The second thing is for there to be uh, a recognition uh, of each other as part of a, a, a similar goal or the same project that we're, we're all trying to get to a different economic, and I would say economic system defined very broadly. So we really do need to think about transforming not only the economy, but as part of it, all interconnected, our society, our political system, our culture, um, the way that we think about um, ourselves, each other, our relationships, and our relationship to Mother Earth. So all that I, I say is, is broadly in, encompassed when I talk about um, economic transformation. Um, but all these practices need to recognize each other as part of the same project of transformation. Um, right now, these, you know, the co-ops have a tendency to talk to the co-ops and the community land trust talk to the community land trust and the credit unions talk to the credit unions. And there isn't that interconnection. So one, it's coming out of invisibility. Two, it's, it's a certain amount of recognizing each other as part of the same project. And the third is making those connections. So starting to build those either supply chains or those value chains where so in the case of production, where the, the producer is looking to buy their inputs from another solidarity economy um, practitioner or producer. Um, and the financing is coming from a loan fund or is coming from a credit union. And maybe they're using um, uh, local currency um, to do their exchanges. So that's, that's where, where we're heading towards, trying to integrate all these aspects. Um, and... Uh, let me just say, by way of wrapping up, solidarity economy is certainly gaining a lot of momentum throughout the world. Um, for better or worse, the UN now has a task force on solidarity economy. There are a number of governments that have um, enshrined it in their constitution, so Bolivia and Ecuador. There are also a number of governments that have a department of social solidarity economy. And then there are a number of countries that are moving framework legislation. So uh, overarching legislation, for example, that would require the government to, uh, all the departments of a government to support social solidarity economy um, practices. Um, so I'll end there.
Um, hello, uh, again, I'm Ed Whitfield, and part of the reason why I work in the difficult area of the South is because that's where I was born. <laughs> born, <laughs> raised born there. <laughs> and you're in Vermont now, though. <laughs> okay, I, I hear you. So I could have left. I guess, I, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Um, <laughs> But what I want to talk about is something about the transformation in the world that I've been concerned with since I was a teenager and couldn't figure out why people were being sent halfway around the world to kill folk in the name of democracy when you couldn't vote next door in Mississippi and Alabama. And it never made any sense to me. And because it didn't make any sense, and I was willing to say so, and have always liked to call out stuff that didn't make any sense, um, it put me in a position of being critical and in opposition to so many things that my government has done since then. And, you know, it would take way more time than we have if we were to try to make a list of them. Uh, but in particular, we have a system that is somewhat irrational in its nature. And it is for this reason that we need a different system. Part of the irrationality of it is evident in some of the situations of the last couple of weeks, which are reflective of the situation over the last several years, which are reflective of the situation over the last few decades, which are reflective of the situation that have been happening in this country since its founding in genocide, enslaved, enslavement of Africans, indentured servitude of, of European coming here as labor, a private ownership system that was connected to the theft of land and then stealing enough labor to work that land so that it would have some value to it. This is the roots of what we have. And so I really do think that there, there needs to be a coming to grips with the reality of where we live and what it actually means. Somebody was once talking about uh, American exceptionalism. <laughs> and this historian from Texas once said, he said, I find it incredibly exceptional that a country that was founded in genocide and slavery passes itself as a passes itself off as a paragon of virtue in the world. That's, that's really exceptional that, that that can even happen. If we want to understand what's wrong with the economy now and what it needs to transition into, it, it, it takes our ability to take the blinders off as we look at where we are, what it does, and, and, and why. The form of the insanity is that you have people who are perfectly capable and willing to be engaged in social production so that they can produce for themselves and their families and their communities, and yet who are not able to do so by virtue of the fact that we have a set of rules in place connected with the tools and structures that are in place that prevent people from accessing that which they need in order to be productive. So, you know, if you can imagine that at one point in time there might have been people on this earth who had access to nature as a place where they could go and do work and build tools that they would need to work the land, and this is how they provided for themselves and their family, and found themselves locked away from it by some things that were connected with what someone called ownership. So someone passing around, waving a piece of paper that they said was a title meant that you could no longer access this space, this land, this dirt that no one made that we all only found, but now you couldn't access it because somebody has a piece of paper in their hand to call a title to it, which means that every time you set foot on, you owe him rent. And it can only be with, with permission that you have access to that which you need to stay alive. This is a fundamental form of ultimate control over somebody's life if you fully control that which they need in order to live. People, we, we don't last very long if we don't have access to food, and if we're not in a position to go there and grow or gather food, which again, the control of, of land space gives someone control over, and in a more modern technology, in a more modern world, the control over the machinery that allows you to produce the so many things that we use that are efficiently produced by machines, and we have no access to this, then somebody who does have access and control over it virtually controls our lives and can determine whether or not we're standing around as potentially productive people, yet with nothing to do watching our families and our communities starve. And when those communities that are in those conditions 
react and erupt and say no more, this is ridiculous, then we come in contact with those apparatus of the government that is set up to control and maintain those property relations. And at the lowest level, that is the local police, and they are empowered, they are fully empowered to kill you if you threaten that or even if you threaten their authority. And so this is what we see. So this is part of the innate irrationality of, of, of this world, and this is affecting communities of color, it's affecting white working class communities. It's uh, affecting those communities of people who have come more recently into this, uh, in, into this polity, into the, the United States from other parts of the world that are it, themselves affected by the outreach of this very same system, this very same imperialist system that reaches out into the world, destroys other economies, and has desperate people coming here looking to be somewhere near this giant pile of money that's been piled up off of the extraction of them from the, their own lands and their communities. So that, that's what we got. And what we need, what we need is a system where not only the earth itself is returned to the commons, where it is available to the people of the world to use to meet their needs and elevate the quality of life, but also that which has derived from the earth through the labor over millennia of people that has been concentrated in the form of money that serves as, a, as, as a, a storage place for value. And all of the things that that money can buy, the machinery, the tools, the, the, the buildings, uh, the transportation equipment, the infrastructure, all of that needs to be part of a commons that is utilized for the benefit of people to meet their needs and elevate the quality of life according to the values that are established in community. And so that everybody in community is able to benefit from that. So that's kind of the, the, the picture of what it would look like in a way. How do we get there? For many of us in this room, hopefully we get there by doing what we're doing, but we have an aid that is, we have something going on. And I like to think of it as how do we change the world in a world that is changing? Because the option of the world staying the same is not, that's not on the table. Um, it's changing under its own, under its own logic. Uh, under its own internal contradictions, there are transformations taking place. So we don't have to ask, will there be a crisis? Uh, we're living sort of in one right now. We don't have to even ask ourselves, is it going to get worse? The answer to that is yes. The only question is, what will we do? Because quite frankly, we do have a couple of alternative directions that things can go in, either toward a more sane, more just, uh, uh, more loving world, or toward terrible barbarism, um, but it won't keep on this, the, the, the center will not hold. Um, it won't keep on this kind of piddling uh, liberal solution, which is you know, ruled by experts and the promise that anyone who gets an education will be able to, to live and live well, which is more and more being made the lie by the financial structure even of getting an education that is denied it to so many people or leave them essentially in debt peonage for almost the rest of their lives for the cost of having tried to do so in order to enter into an economy that is itself sick already. That's kind of that's, that's kind of what we have. So I end up, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's something really, really short. Um, by a young man named uh, Umi Salah. Does anyone here know who he is? Umi Salah is the uh, head of the Florida Dream Defenders that came into existence after Trayvon Martin was, was uh, but, and he's in his 30s, and he's a young person, was organizing students at first, and now he's working in the community. And he said a lot of people have been contacting him in the last week about, you know, what are we gonna do, how, you know, things that awful, you know, what's going on. And he said he wish he had an, a, a simple answer. And it, sometimes he just called upon to say, I don't know. But then he said, but that's a lie. I do know. But the answer is long, complex, and not sexy. It's hard work and sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. It's a strategy that will force many of us to quit our jobs, live less comfortably, deprogram, then reprogram our minds and the minds of our children, knock on doors, be rooted in poor communities, experiment with models of justice and reconciliation and democracy, go to war with ego and individualism and dominance and exploitation, 
reconnect with love and empathy, build organization. That's the work we're doing now. And I wanted to hold up that Umi Salah, a good friend of mine, says this, and this is what we have to keep doing to build that world where the commons, where the earth and finance are back in the commons, owned by the people, for the people, and of the people. Thank you. Well, Mike is recovering from having to follow that. <laughs> uh, let me just say that, uh, uh, Ed, uh, that is a, a brilliant summation of, of what Ed has written eloquently. In, 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 I'm sorry. You got it. That, that is a brilliant summation of what Ed has written in the paper for us, uh, which is, will shortly be, uh, be published online. Uh, and uh, if so, if your notes are not adequate to, up to his standard, you'll have it all soon. Thank you. Okay. Well, I want to pick up a little bit on uh, Ed's comment with respect to the ground is shifting underneath and how do we talk about building the next system with the kind of major global, global crises that we are facing. And as I was asked by Gus to write this paper, and I've been a practitioner in all kinds of settings, regional, community sectors, development finance, etc., over a long period of time. And I had an epiphany about 13 years ago that brought climate change directly into an emotional and spiritual crisis for me as I accompanied my first grandchild to look at the salmon coming up on the west coast of Vancouver Island and having read a paper that those salmon wouldn't exist in 40 years if climate change uh, was not... Uh, dealt with. And so that started a, a journey that came in an interesting way, not into focus, but considering that some of the issues we're facing are more important than others in global terms and are going to impact us, whether we like it or not, wherever we live and whoever we are. So. These won't be a surprise to you, but climate change and the urgency of reducing GHGs and the massive investments that are needed for transition and climate adaptation, the ecological crises and the need for massive investment in ecological restoration, the growing and accelerating precariousness of livelihoods, which incidentally a recent Oxford study was released about a year ago that suggested 47 million jobs in America could be gone in 20 years as a result of robotification and the Internet of Things. Right? And then the need for some means by which sustainable, guaranteed incomes are going to be available to all citizens. And the fourth one that I struggled with uh, in this paper is around the question of finance. And in particular, the control of private banks over 97% of our money supply, which they issue out of thin air every time we take out a loan or our governments go to the capital markets to finance infrastructure or whatever. And it bears interest, compound interest. So that's on the one hand, and our need to reclaim sovereignty to issue debt-free money, to finance the massive investments that are required to transition to a low-carbon, fairer economy based on solidarity and reciprocity and a capacity to live within the limits of one Earth. This is a huge challenge, and it affects us at every level. So my question becomes, from thinking about not only the shape of the next system, but how we get there, uh, how do we align our efforts, whatever they may be, to maximize their potential uh, for uh, us to organize and to federate our efforts 
to advance our capacity to meet basic needs, because basic needs are going to be potentially increasingly under threat. So obviously food, energy, social care, uh, the question of land reform and the linkage of that to uh, perpetually affordable housing, which seems like an oxymoron where I live, one of the second most expensive cities in the world. But these issues are kind of critical. They're systemic and they're critical to building the next system and shaping a life. Um, so I want to provide three examples uh, to illustrate what I think are key features of a very different system. One's local and regional, one's local and global, and one addresses the monetary reform issue in a transformative way. So the first comes from Japan and relates to transforming the food system. Uh, it started modestly with a group of women contracting a farmer uh, to buy the entire production of that farmer for a fair price in exchange for ecologically grown food. If you're wondering where the birthplace of the CSA movement was, it was really a migration, at least I've been told, from this experience in Japan. Uh, so I just wanted to say that because I know a number of people here in this conference are involved in the food sector and CSAs would be part of the mix. The farmer agreed he would do this, but he required them to deal with the distribution. Thus was born uh, the beginnings of the Saikatsu Cooperative. There are thousands of such groups that exist in Japan, and they're federated, and this is important, they're federated into 32 uh, uh, regional uh, cooperatives. You could think of them as county or multi-county areas. Uh, and um, they are in turn federated into a national federation. So they have a system that is based on values of fair price and ecological production and greening and reducing carbon along the entire supply chain. The processing, packaging, and recycling links in the supply chain is made up of 600 collectively owned enterprises owned by 17,000 members, right? S sales are well over a billion dollars a year, just, just on the food side, never mind the revenue flows along the supply chain. Uh, there is 450 million in equity embedded in this system, made up largely, not just of retained earnings, but largely of $11 a month voluntary contributions from the consumer members, up to a maximum of $3,500. Saikatsu means living people, and it shows up big time. The consumer members of Saikatsu see themselves as co-producers and co-investors in the transition of a food system. And that's important. Because we don't think like that as consumers. And if we're going to bring in and usher in another system, we're going to have to begin to think of ourselves as co-investors and producers of that system. They've also extended their reach uh, into other sectors. Politically, they've led the fight in Japan against GMOs, so there's a resistance capacity. Uh, they've elected uh, uh, 140 members into local government councils. They've expanded into child care and elder care in a very, very big way, and they're making modest inroads into renewable energy. So what does this tell us about the shape of the next system? Decentralized, democratic, distributed, diversified, and federated around an agenda that's advancing transition to a fair, caring, low-carbon economy. How many of you have heard of Bia Campesina? So, I'm not going to say a lot about it, but it represents 500 million peasants and farmers across the planet. The largest movement, grassroots movement in the world. Globally, they organize against World Trade Organization rules and so on and so forth because that system is shaping and marginalizing 
their sovereignty over their own food supply. And at the local level and regional level, they focus on reduction of greenhouse gases through education and support to adopt agroecological methods. So this is the kind of federating strategy I think we need to be thinking about in sectors and across geographies. Uh, and that is both the shape of the system, if in fact we want to govern democratically, we're going to have to federate and find ways of connecting the dots. Uh, I think the new economy movement, what attracts me about it is that it is a kind of a br br brilliant beginning. Uh, and uh, I want to then stop, or I'll stop with one last point you know, around monetary form. And I'm going to argue that I think this is going to have to become a central priority. I don't see this issue reflected in the agenda here, but it's one that needs to be because it affects actually every part of our work. Can you uh, tell the Bank of Canada story? Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. So we live through this money creation system, which we then pay compound interest on, essentially in what many of us don't even recognize, at least in terms of the way money is created, but it represents an invisible prison. The bars of a prison are invisible, we're living within it, and a lot of our politics and our issues and so on bounce up against that all the time and shape a political dynamic that is not particularly necessarily going to be transformative, even though it's important. What's that? Preach. <laughs> All right, I'm going to change my voice, brother. <laughs> See if I can get a little bit of that other tone. <laughs> so let me just tell you this story, which is the story is it doesn't have to be this way. So for 35 years in Canada, it wasn't. So we nationalized the central bank, which was created in 1934 and 1938 essentially issued a significant portion of the money supply on a debt-free basis. We fought the war. We put in the Trans-Canada Highway. We put in the St. Lawrence Seaway. We provided long-term, low-cost loans to municipalities and provinces. We invested and secured the basic foundations for our social security and health system. And by 19... 74, our accumulated debt at the federal level was 37 billion. Then the International Bank of Settlements came and talked to our current Prime Minister's father, Pierre Trudeau, and the government caved to the pressure to, in a sense, get out of the game of creating currency and borrow from the banks. By 19, okay, so from 75 to 1993, our debt went to 400 billion. By 1994, our debt went to 500 billion. The Auditor General in 1993, who looks at all the government accounts and tries to understand what's going on, said that 91% of our accumulated debt was the result of compound interest, compounding on compound interest. I think, you know, this is kind of critical. From 74, we paid one trillion dollars. We're a small country, we're one-tenth the size of you. One trillion dollars we've spent in interest to the banks. Where's that going? That's going to the top, to the one percent. It contributes to inequality. It contributes to unsustainable growth. That debt has to be paid back and we have to pay it. How, if we do not deal with this issue, are we going to deal with the fact that in our t my town, it's $11 billion just to deal with, and that's 2013, with a one meter sea level rise. How are we going to deal with the opportunities that exist to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and promote energy democracy? How are we going to deal with ecological restoration, which is absolutely amazingly possible, and we have many, many examples, if it's going to be based on debt-based financing. I'll just stop with uh, one last point, and I'll stop. We have a $20 billion investment 
uh, program for infrastructure that was announced by our new government. This is like a big change in our political complexion up north. And I said, well, I really want to understand what it might mean if we still finance that way. So think of $20 billion, crumbling infrastructure, all this kind of stuff. You all know that. Secondly, uh, our financing, when our federal government goes to the market, it pays 2.7%. Good rate. Toronto pays almost 4%. Some other towns pay 6 7%. The cost of capital during that, what I just told you about the Bank of Canada, was 0.37%. So I said, okay, take 0.5%, look at uh, $1 billion over a 20-year period, what's the cost of that interest? That's $715 million in interest. For $20 billion over 20 years, that's $7 billion. Think about that cutting across an economy and think about what that means in terms of what we see happening in the system now and why this issue is absolutely important to begin to integrate into our narrative and the way we think about our work wherever we are but also how we federate to put our sovereignty back into uh, the way we issue our money. Good. Thank you. Well, that, that Bank of Canada story is a very important one, uh, I think, for us to, to tune into. Uh, now, we want to throw the floor open uh, for questions, for comments, for howls, for agreements. And somebody uh, can manage a mic for us, I hope, down there. Um, who might do that? Where, where is, uh, could you do that? Thank you. There's a hand right over here. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I'm Tom Spaulding. I'm at Angelic Organics Association in Illinois. Um, we're a, a community land trust, a, a not-for-profit education and training, and a for-profit community-supported agriculture farm with 2,000 family members. Um, and we, we created a, uh, a land trust to be able to hold the land in perpetuity and to try and take it out of the speculative marketplace um, and we also just financed an expansion of the farm using social uh, investors who are offering lo loans for 15 years at 0% interest. Uh, we offer loans to the farmers that we train at 0% interest for 10-year for loans, up to $10,000. Um, so we're, we're dabbling this area. But the thing that's really weighing on me right now about the CSA movement is that over the last couple of years, it, the market's become very soft. Increasingly, CSA farms are having trouble filling their, their memberships. You know, 20%, 30% down is the kind of thing I'm hearing from CSA farmers around the country. Our, our own farm went down about 20% over last year. The farmer's markets, which is another place that consumers connect in this, this solid emerging, so I've been so excited about this part of the economy merging, and I'm glad you lifted it up as an example, but I think it's something that's really being challenged right now. After the recession, I think it really hit into people's ability to pull the money out of their pockets in advance to be a member of a CSA. And the other thing that happened, I think, is the industry is pushing back, greenwashing, lots of convenience, using, you can go to Walmart now and they say local, sustainable, blah, blah, blah. But the consciousness is not there among the eaters to say, you know what, I wanna be part of a solidarity economy and that's how I express it, by being part of a member. I'm not just a consumer of food from this farmer. I am the farm. That's, we're not there yet. People don't have a farm in their heart. They, they're, they're still going to the farmer and saying, give me a good price on some organic produce. But that's not where we have to be. Somehow we have to evolve to, you know, I'm, a, I'm an eater, I am the farm, and the farmer has to be thinking out for the well-being of the people. Um, anyway, I wonder about the soft economy, if you guys can talk to that at all in terms of that challenge. How do we, how do we build that next phase of growth for the CSA? If it is truly a merging model, it's challenged right now. Um, yeah, I, so one thought is, is federating 
in some way. But I guess on a more general level, it raises the question of, of, uh, of planning and the importance of planning. Um, and while I personally um, believe that there is a role for markets, there probably, I also believe that there's a role for planning and coordination. And so if every single CSA, in, in addition to the farmers markets are competing with each other, even with the best of intentions, um, it's going to be difficult. And, um, you know, if we are working to build resilient food systems, it makes sense for those farmers not to, you know, to, to the extent where uh, that there's cooperation and coordination, um, as opposed to each operating individually um, and using planning, maybe local planning, maybe it's broader. Um, I'm not exactly sure what, what that looks like, um, but I do think it's something that we, we need to grapple with, right? Uh, market, markets versus planning, and what's the right balance? Um, I'm gonna guess that the people who quit buying from the CSA didn't do it because they quit eating food. I, I think that, and, and so the question is, you know, if indeed they, they mainly went to the Walmarts and, and the Whole Foods instead, um, then that's a, a kind of built-in problem. There are a lot of people that don't have a lot of choice in terms of whether or not they buy food from the cheapest places available to them because of the precariousness of their, uh, you know, their lives. Uh, so that the wage movements that are going on to fight for higher uh, minimum wage are part of putting enough income in people's pocket to be able to be able to purchase the things that make more sense. Some of us live slightly more privileged lifestyles and we're able to make choices. And their whole business sectors, even within the cooperative world, are almost organized around it. At some level, the food co-op world um, that emerged in the 1970s you know, has that, and it's, into, it's in a crisis right now. Because exactly the thing you're describing, which is that you can buy local, natural, organic, uh, out of the biggest retailer in the world that thinks nothing about any of those things as values. Those are marketing, branding things that they're, that they're using. Uh, and, and people are not able to hire, pay a premium price point for the food by going into the actual local thing, and it was built around premium prices being paid for folk who couldn't find natural foods before. And so it became a privileged market. So we helped organize a, a, a cooperative grocery store in a food desert in Greensboro, and we were told by the experts in the food co-op world that the community we were working in was too black, too poor, and too uneducated to have a successful co-op. So I, I'm saying that to say that there's some sectors, even in, in some of the progressive economic circles like cooperatives that were tuned toward actually servicing a certain privileged thing as opposed to looking at communities as a whole and seeing how they were going to interface with them. So that's an issue that we have to deal with in terms of the, the models, the economic models that we are developing so that we can embrace entire communities and find out how we are speaking to the economic needs of those entire communities and do very, very creative things to be able to do so and build a political fight if needed to fight for things that currently will, are not financially viable under the existing structures. So you were, you were, you were told it wouldn't work, but it did work. Oh yeah, they were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we didn't pay any, we didn't pay that much attention to that foolishness. Um, and you know, it, it's been a five year run toward getting the financing in place. Because again, the people in the community eat. There, there are distributors that distribute to to uh, local small grocers across the country, and all you had to do was get them bidding against each other to be able to get it, and get a pretty good deal with the distributor, and it's gonna end up being a professionally managed but democratically governed store uh, within a community that is just beginning to feel what it means and what difference it makes to be able to own a piece of its own local economy. The, the weight of the old system is not only in the physical constraints that it makes and the financial direct constraints, it's also inside our heads. That's what I piece from, from Umi about us deconstructing what we understand about reality and reconstructing a, a new understanding of the world is so necessarily a, a part of our work that has to, to be done. Um, and you know, so folk gotta realize that communities can actually be their own developers as opposed to thinking that a, who a developer is, a wealthy person who has access to finance, who comes into the community in order to make something for himself, and that there's some social benefit going to trickle down from his profit-oriented motive. 
And so we have to have a new paradigm on development altogether that we are capable of developing the things that we need for ourselves and create that as a new reality. Hi, my name, is this on? Yeah. My name's Jesse Marshall. Um, I'm based in Troy, and as a 26-year-old whippersnapper, I want to thank all of you for, for the inspiration that you've given uh, to me and a lot of others to, to dedicate my life to economic democracy. And I want to thank the folks at the Next System Project, um, because as a young whippersnapper um, with radical priorities, um, I found a lot of people out there doing really incredible work who don't I don't think really believe that they can win and that you know the future we want to see is is within our grasp um, and what I want to suggest or, or you know get some uh, sort of a sounding board from you all is that we have the potential we have all the the kind of practices that we need to implement a next system at the local level now um, so what we've been working on in Troy is a framework that integrates cooperative enterprise property development, and the caring economy within a single neighborhood in a structure that is owned by that neighborhood. Um, and what, what I found more and more is that our greatest obstacle to the kind of the change that we want to see is us. It's our own belief in ourselves and that we, can, that we can do this, and it's our belief in others that we can come together and trust one another um, and, and work together. Um, and I, I think that we have the capacity within this movement right now to create a clear choice for people that life is better off, quality of life is better off within the next system than not in it. Um, and that if we can think comprehensively in that way, we can have that kind of impact. And I think that that is the basis for power building and political change starting at the local level and moving up. Um, so that's more of a, a diatribe than a question, but I wanted to, to think, hear what you all thought of that. Well, there we go. Thank you. Uh, another question. Back in the back. Yes, thank you. I don't know if I need a mic, but I'll use one. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Trina. I live and work in Boston. And um, my question really is really directed for Ed and Emily. Um, I, I would love to get your reactions to uh, an ob some observations I've been making uh, with people that I work with in Boston, mostly uh, black communities, communities of color, that would include immigrants as well. And, you know, when we talk about this new system, this new economic system and this solidarity economy framework, um, I, I still hear that people, you know, are very sort of attached to the values, though, of capitalism and, and the visions of capitalism. People still want to get rich. People still want to, you know, uh, have, people are still thinking of ownership in the very sort of capitalist ways, I think, if I'm making sense. Because, you know, people have not really experienced that. Um, and it's been a challenge to kind of, you know, engage people on a different kind of vision. That, you know, it isn't about like getting rich or necessarily getting yours or whatever. And I hope I'm making sense a little bit about where I'm coming from about this challenge. So I'm very interested in what are your reactions if I'm coming across clearly, what are the strategies to shifting even the core vision of what is possible and, and addressing the addiction to visions of capitalism? Thank you. That, that sounds like one for Emily. Emily's insisting I start. Uh, first of all, given all of the ways that people are inundated with that message of, of uh, individualism and you got to get yours that come out of the, the popular culture, that come out of the media, uh, that come out of the educational system, uh, just, just think about all of the places that other message that you want to get people out of is coming from and how few places a message of, you know, we should care about the community as a whole. Um, we can build an economy to meet our needs. We can figure out how to elevate the quality of life. Um, none of us have to be rich, but we should all have enough. I mean, where do, where do they get that message from? So we're gonna have to amplify that message at the same time we turn down the other one. Uh, the other thing is we have to create places where people can see it in action. 
and learn to love it. So we have to create existence proofs. We have to be able to point to something and show somebody that this is what I'm talking about. So we will have, hopefully, in the next few months, that little grocery store in Greensboro, which will be one of the few places in the entire country. And we didn't even know that when we started working on it. We figured that somebody else must have already done this, but we knew that's what we needed in our community because that's what the folk there wanted, and we could help them learn how to do it. But the mindset of we're looking for a developer who's going to come in here and do this for us, and it's just how things work, that they're going to make a bunch of money out of it that's going to leave out of our community. That was accepted until we offered the, no, it's actually a different way to do it. It's like, oh, there is? I'm like, yeah, let me describe it to you. It's like, wow, will that really work? It's like, sure, let's do it. <laughs> so we took people on a path, a process of engaging in and doing it, where now we got you know, 40 to 100 people every month that come out to hear how their thing is going. Um, and I think that we have to learn how to build on that and build into the, the educational process so that when they want the next thing built, they're not looking for a developer, but looking to say, how can we get a group of us together and figure out to, to get with some of the folk who can help us find the financing and stuff we need so we can build this because we need it in our community and for our children and the jobs it can produce. Okay. Um. Yeah, I really like that about um, some concrete reality to point to. I think that's so important to kind of dispel um, dispel this feeling of hopelessness. And and I would say that I was I, I'm a lifelong pessimist and cynic. And <laughs> solidarity economy for me has been really kind of life changing in that uh, it's not uh, it's not about finding the perfect ism right, the perfect brand of socialism or whatever. Um, it's saying we're building this road as we're, as we're walking and we don't have all the answers and we're trying to figure it out. But to your question about um, how, do you, how, do you, how do people, how do we as human beings move in a different direction that's not about just acquisitiveness and, and uh, making the most money, I, I'd also, I'd flip it and I'd say uh, capitalism and the theory of, so I'm an economist, so I'll say that the theory of capitalism is grounded in, is, is, it's a belief system, and the main character, homo economicus, which is a term we use in economic theory, right, um, economic man, and we talk in terms of man, um, is rational, is calculating, is, um, self, is max, self maximizing, trying to get the, the biggest bang for the buck for themselves, um, and and is competitive, and that's the assumption of human nature. And our economic system of capitalism is grounded in that assumption, and that that is raised to this level of virtue that if we all engage in this individualistic, competitive, self, self-serving, self-maximizing behavior, we'll get the greatest common good. So there's something really fundamentally problematic because it completely ignores the, uh, I mean, I won't deny that human beings have those elements, those characteristics, but there's another side of us that's about uh, reciprocity and solidarity and caring and love and trust and and that's why don't we lift up the better side of our what is it the better angels of our nature um, yeah why not build uh, try to build a society and economy that really tries to encourage that recognizing that those other things exist right um, but but trying to encourage that and I think the proof that we're wired to do that, right, and there's lots and lots of science, uh, whether it's uh, 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 biology or sociology or anthropology, or it's coming from everywhere, um, that we really are wired to care for each other, to uh, have solidarity, to have reciprocity, um, and the amount of all that that, that uh, exists in all its richness and all the good things that people do for each other and for their family and for their communities, in the face of this onslaught of capitalism that's constantly telling you that the way to be successful is compete, make money, buy lots of stuff, is really amazing. So I think we do need to, to recognize that, that that is very resilient and that is part, that is a strong part of human nature, right, to love each other, care about each other. Well, 
I, I think uh, there there are many hands, uh, and I think they'll have to be pursued after the uh, event. We're, my charge is to try to keep things more or less on schedule. Just two concluding uh, comments. One reminded uh, when Emily talked about uh, pessimism that things are much too bad for pessimism. <laughs> and the, uh, the other thing is this a link, the powerful link between what so many of the organizations and people here are doing at the community level. And, and, and the sort of larger scale transformation. I mean, imagine when the next crisis hits, uh, and it will, there will be numerous of them, I think. Uh, people will look around uh, for something better. They will look to see what's going on in the communities. Uh, if we help people see, as was said, what is actually going on, what is transpiring, uh, you know, then we can create a, a collective vision of where we want to take on things on a larger scale. And, you know, seeing is believing. And people, when they see the reality of the changes that many of you are working every day for, uh, it is transformational. And I thank you all very much, and I thank the panel especially for these wonderful comments. Mm.